Well, it probably would have been the summer of either 1996 or 97, and I was driving down East Leonard Avenue in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, and uh, drove past St. Alphonsus Catholic Church. And seeing the church, uh, I was reminded that I really had a strong desire uh, to go to confession. And I had an urge, in fact, to just stop the errand that I was on and uh, turn into that parking lot and uh, see if I could track down a priest uh, to unburden myself of some issues that were on my heart. Now, that in itself may not seem so surprising to you because maybe you've had a similar experience uh, where you've had stuff on your mind and heart and you passed a church and it, it uh, prompted something in you and you thought, you know, I, I really need to get to confession. You know, it's been too long. You know, it's been a, been a couple months. I really need to get back to that sacrament and get right with the Lord. However, what made it a little bit unusual in my circumstances was, first of all, I wasn't Catholic. And secondly, I was the pastor of the Protestant church four blocks away. <laughs> so what was going on? Why, why was I a Protestant pastor having this urge to confess? Well, there's a, there's a backstory to this, of course. Um, I was a young pastor. I'd only been in the pastorate for a couple of years. And, uh, of course, in Protestant traditions, they don't give you a lectionary. You've got to invent your own uh, scripture texts for every week. So I did what a lot of Protestant pastors do, and I took different books of the Bible and would try to preach through them. And that way I would know, you know, what I was going to be doing for the next uh, several weeks. And so I had preached through Philippians, and I had preached through Ephesians, and uh, some other books. But I got to the Epistle of James, and I was doing a sermon series on James. And the first four chapters of James went fine. Um, preaching about it, and of course, you know, I had, I had very little oversight because I was pastoring in an area of the city where nobody wanted to be, so um, they, they just kind of left me alone to do my thing down there, and uh, I was very young and zealous and um, insistent that we were going to have a New Testament church, we are going to get back to the teaching of Christ and the apostles, and since I had a kind of a free hand, I felt like we just had the, the freedom to implement the original faith and uh, strip away uh, all the um, uh, concessions that had crept into American Christianity and Western Christianity over the ages. So that was my mentality. We're preaching through the New Testament. We're going to get back to the original faith. So again, I was preaching through James, and like I said, the first uh, four chapters went fine, but then I got to uh, James chapter 5, and in particular, I got to this passage... Uh, I'm going to start around James 5.14. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick man and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now here's the real kicker. This is verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And that's the verse that I didn't know how to preach. But okay, so I'm going to stand up in front of my congregation. I'm going to tell them, we're going to start applying this verse in this parish. How are we going to do that? Pass a mic on the Sunday service? Okay, we're going to pass around a mic. We're going to all confess our sins to one another. You start, Sally. No, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, we already were passing around a mic in my church for praise and prayer time. And even with prayers and praises, that wasn't always edifying because sometimes folks were praising God for getting away from the police and stuff. It was that kind of neighborhood <laughs> that I was ministering to. Okay? So I didn't, you know, I don't even want people to praise anymore, much less start confessing their sins. So I thought, well, okay, if we can't do it in the, in the big group, maybe we could do a small group. You know, and I thought, okay, so what do I tell them? All right, we're going to divide up into groups of five, find four other people, 
move to different areas of the sanctuary and just confess your sins to one another, you know? No, that ain't going to work. Uh, we, we, uh, we were in a neighborhood where, as we said uh, back in the day, everybody be in everybody else's business, all right? I mean, anything that got mentioned on Sunday by, uh, by Monday, by 3 p.m., okay, the rest of the neighborhood would know. So uh, I didn't want to do that, okay? You got a major confidentiality problem. Plus, I could imagine, okay, what if we got these, group, these small groups and uh, there's an elder in one of the group of five, and then there's a teenager there too, and then the elder lets out that he's committed some sin, and the poor teen is scandalized. Oh my gosh, Elder Jones has done whatever, you know, and, and, and damages his faith or gives him bad example. And then I thought of other scenarios too. Maybe they're sharing their sins, and somebody says, well, you know, I, I did such and such a week, this week, and some older lady says, oh, that's okay, I do that all the time. That's not really a sin. Okay. All right, then I got bad counsel going on. So I could see, okay, scandal, confidentiality, bad counsel. This is a whole can of worms, you know? But then I'm like, well, what about my, my zeal to preach the literal sense of Scripture? And that we were going to be a New Testament church, and we were going to do just what the New Testament said and apply it word for word. Just couldn't find a way, couldn't think of a way practically to do it. But then, I don't know why I thought about this, but there's a little spark in my brain. I started to think about the Catholic Church. And then I started to draw on my extensive knowledge about Catholic liturgy, piety, and theology, which was all from movies. <laughs> it's a great catechetical resource. You know, The Exorcist, you know, other... Catholic movies, you know, so, um, so and, but, but for watching movies, I had a basic idea of how Catholic confession worked, and, uh, you know, I know you, you go into the closet and make the sign of cross and say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned, later found out it was bless me, Father, for I have sinned, but anyway, you say that, and, and, and then you can confess, and I, I began to reflect on that, and I thought, you know, my goodness, the, the Catholics actually have a way of obeying this scripture. You know, I began to reflect on what little I knew about the Catholic sacrament of reconciliation. But I thought, yeah, they have a way of obeying James 5.16 that, that avoids scandal and bad counsel and confidentiality issues. They can all go to their pastor. And they can confess to their pastor in secret. But the, their pastor represents the whole congregation. He's the, he's the spiritual head of the whole congregation. So in a sense, they're confessing to the whole church through him because he's the spiritual head. Plus, he represents Christ. So they're, they are confessing to Christ as well. And they can do that uh, without these other problems that I mentioned. And they have that availability, and they can even you know, do that in any part of the world. And, uh, and I thought, that's... That's not bad. And for the first time in my life, I had a twinge of Catholic envy. <laughs> but they, they have a way, they have a way of obeying the word of God open to them, which is not available to me as a non-Catholic, because I couldn't think of any way uh, to implement what James is saying without causing a whole heck of a lot of problems. And then I began reflecting on my own life because James 5.16 says, confess your sins to one another, pray for one another that you may be healed. And I began to reflect on my own spirituality and I had just reached a kind of plateau, uh, you know, where I did not seem to make progress. And week after week, I was fighting the same kind of habitual sins and I didn't have that spiritual healing that I longed for, and I wasn't having that kind of victory in my spiritual life that I so desired. And I began to think to myself, maybe, John, the reason why you're not making more progress is because you're not obeying the word of God. You're too proud to go confess your sins to somebody else and ask for prayer. So I began to think, well, how can I do this? And I'm like, well, can't go to my wife, okay? 
that could be bad. <laughs> Can't go to my parishioners, right? You know, that's unfair to them. That's like a breach of, conf- of professional boundaries, you know, to you know, get one of my parishioners and then uh, unburden myself on them. Now, there are older pastors around, you know, that I could go to perhaps, but you know, we were a very formal tradition. It was, this was Dutch Calvinism, okay? I don't know if Dutch Calvinism means anything to you guys, but who, who here knows of what Presbyterianism is? Who's heard of Presbyterianism? Okay, a lot of you. Okay, so think Presbyterians with wooden shoes and windmill cookies. Okay? <laughs> there you go, okay? That, that was my tradition. But, you know, we are kind of formal, and that would be very, very awkward if I went to one of these older pastors in the area and, uh, and said, you know, would you, you know, there's some things I want to share with you and unburden, and he would be uncomfortable with that, I would be uncomfortable, there would be professional boundary issues, and then, too, it would seem too Catholic. And that would be bad, because we were definitely uh, against everything that Catholicism stood for. So I couldn't think of of a way to do this. But then, you see, I grew up in the Navy because my father was a U.S. Navy chaplain. And, of course, there's a lot of Catholic Navy chaplains. And seeing as how Catholic Navy chaplains are celibate and don't have uh, a family to go home to for dinner in the evening, my dad would often invite his Catholic priest chaplain friends over to our house for family dinner. And so I grew up occasionally having priests in the house. So I was like priest tolerant, okay? I was like, <laughs> I, was like I, I was comfortable with them. I knew most priests were pretty chill, you know, and, um, and they had seen a lot of life. You know, I knew priests saw a lot of life, and, uh, and they swung with a lot of weird situations. And I'd, I'd seen them, you know, cope with some odd uh, circumstances uh, in my own experience. So uh, that's why I'm driving down. I see St. Alphonsus Church. I'm like, you know, priests are, you know, are chill guys. I, I, I've known some priests. I'm, I'm sure if I walked in there and, and, and found a priest and said, you know, Father, uh, I'm not really Catholic, but uh, there's some, some things I need to unburden myself of, you know. He, he, he'd probably swing with that, you know, and we could go into the little closet, you know, and, um, and we could talk about stuff. He, he'd, probably, he'd probably be okay with that. So I, I thought, you know, that's, that's a real option. So I'm driving down. I had, I had this urge, but I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And I had that urge again in subsequent weeks for a long time, okay? I often had this, this urge. I thought, you know, I, I really ought to do that sometime. But, but you know what held me back? I had a 1980 dark green Olds Cutlass sedan. A very unique car. It was the only Cutlass sedan of that color in the whole city. <laughs> you can see where this is going. And I knew if I pulled into that parking lot, you know, and, and one of my church members drove by and saw my car in the parking lot of a Catholic church, Oh, my gosh, there would be questions that I did not want to deal with. So, sorry to say, gentlemen, I never got up the courage to make a confession before I actually become Catholic. But already, many years, it wouldn't be till 2001 that I would come into the church. But so many years before, even as a Protestant, confession was drawing me into the Catholic church. Now, that may sound odd, because... uh, Confession is an impediment for many. They're like, oh, why do I have to confess my sins to a man? Blah, blah, blah. Well, because the Bible recommends it. That's number one, okay? And, and I challenge non-Catholics, okay? There's so many non-Catholics out there that claim to stand on the Word of God, and I know they can say that and pass a polygraph, and they generally believe that. But if you are a non-Catholic that stands on the Word of God, I say, amen, brother, I'm with you there. But you tell me how you follow James 5.16 in your tradition. And I can tell you from personal experience, gentlemen, in the Baptist, Lutheran, Calvinist, and every tradition I've encountered, there was no way to follow the command of 5.16, right? But thanks be to God, in the Catholic Church, we do have a way to obey the Scripture. And in subsequent years, I found that was true of a lot of other doctrines as well. But that was just a start. 
So, top three reasons I became Catholic. Confession is one. I'm going to fast forward now. Two, three years later, I'm on the campus of the University of Notre Dame in the fall of 1999, beginning my doctoral program in Scripture. Now you say, what is a Protestant doing at Notre Dame getting a doctorate in Scripture? Well, first of all, let me clarify. I had no intention whatsoever of becoming Catholic. However, Notre Dame has an ecumenical theology department, and they had Protestants teaching in the area that I wanted to do my dissertation on. So, plus, when I sent them an application, they got back enthusiastically and offered me money to come. So I'm thinking, this is great. I'll get paid by Catholics and study with Protestants. It's like robbing the Egyptians. Can't get any better than that. Yeah. And, and maybe I'll score a couple converts while I'm down there. Because I had converted many, you know, non-practicing Catholics that I had run into in uh, the neighborhood where I served uh, up in Michigan. And I figured, you know, I, I know how this is done. I, I had my half a dozen scripture arguments in my back pocket that I used to such good effect against uh, Catholics who hadn't been practicing for a decade and never read the Bible. So uh, I figured this will work down, down in uh, Notre Dame as well. But uh, God had some other plans for me. And um, the, the first guy, almost the first guy, I should say, that I meet when I got down to the campus of Notre Dame had three qualities that I never thought I'd find in the same individual. He was highly intelligent, full of the Holy Spirit, and Catholic. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, how do you get those three qualities in one person without creating some kind of explosion, you know? <laughs> like anti-gravity effect, you know? It's kind of like an oxymoron, you know? Because in, in my experience, I had met, I had met uh, spirit-filled Catholics before, you know, Catholic charismatics and stuff. But when I hung around them, I wasn't sure that their elevator was going to the top floor, you know what I mean? And uh, I was like, okay, Jesus is going to let you into heaven because you just don't know enough to realize you're in the Horebe Avalon, so uh, uh, it's, it's okay for you. And then I had met highly intelligent uh, spirit-filled people, but they had always been Protestant in my experience. I met highly intelligent Catholics, but they tended to be going through the motions and just showing up at, uh, at Mass on Sunday to please their, their mom. And I knew what those people were about, and they didn't impress me too much. But here he had a guy that was highly intelligent, spirit-filled, and Catholic. This is the point, gentlemen. I could not explain away his Catholicism as ignorance or indifference. And for most of the other people that I had met in my life, with the exception of those priests that came to my home, but I was too little to really think through things back then, but most of the Catholics I had met in my life, I had either categorized as, well, they're Catholic because they're indifferent, or they're Catholic because they're ignorant. But I met an inexplicable Catholic. And I challenge you gentlemen this morning, I challenge myself, are we inexplicable Catholics? When people look at us, would they dismiss our Catholicism as, oh, well, you know, he just doesn't know enough, he is not interested in religious matters, so he never reads anything, he doesn't read the Bible, whatever, and that's why he's Catholic. Can anybody say that of us? Or when they look at us, they're just like, well, you know, he's got no passion, uh, you know, he's just going through the motions, this is a cultural thing for him, he's a cultural Catholic. I hope that all of us today, including myself especially, because I want to go to heaven. I hope, anybody else want to go to heaven? Amen. Amen. Thank you. I hope all of us today will leave as inexplicable Catholics that will cause a big question mark in the minds of our co-workers. Like, what makes that guy tick? What's going on with that dude? That's the question I would like to create in the minds of people that know me and the minds of everyone that knows all of us here. So again, I met this, this, uh, this guy, filled with the Holy Spirit, highly intelligent, could not explain his way his Catholicism. So like, I got to know this guy better. You know, I got to find out what makes him tick. And uh, his name was Michael. And uh, I thought, you know what, I, I, I better try my, uh, 
my six biblical uh, anti-Catholic arguments against him, and maybe I'll help him to see the light. Okay. So, uh, so anyway, so I got together with Michael. I was like, you know, we, we really, you know, I'm fascinated by your story. I want to find out, you know, you know, why do you stay in the Catholic Church and stuff like that? And, and so why can't we just, um, you know, maybe get lunch every Wednesday? Um, and so we set up to do that. So we got lunch every Wednesday in the huddle, uh, which was the name for the food court at Notre Dame, because, of course, everything is named after football at Notre Dame. We got Touchdown Jesus Library, at the bottom of which is First Down Moses, three-ton bron- three bronze statue of Moses with his finger up, First Down, you know. And then we had the food court, which is called the huddle. And so anyway, we go to the huddle and we get our two Whopper Juniors for two bucks from Burger King and uh, sit down there in one of the booths and uh, we'd, we'd eat our burgers and talk theology. And so this began our relationship, my, my relationship with, with Michael. And uh, so I began to run against Michael my anti-Catholic uh, polemics, right, from... Uh, from uh, the, the scriptures. And when I started to do that, Michael did something extremely unfair that I found, found a little bit offensive, actually. He answered from scripture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he answered from scripture. I'm like, no, wait, no, no, no. Wait, wait, let's, re- let's recall who's who here. <laughs> Me, Protestant, you, Catholic, Okay. Me, me do Bible, we're like KFC, we do one thing right, okay? You, you have to answer from church fathers or papal documents or something like that, you know? You can't, you can't quote from the Bible to support Catholic doctrines. But this is what he did. What he did. And then later I found out he actually carried a, a New Testament around with him to do his spiritual reading on a daily basis, Catholics carrying Bibles, for me, that ranked up there with, like, pigs flying, hell freezing over, and other signs of the end of the world. You know? He he was a Bible-toting Catholic. You know, uh, let me just digress on this. You know, uh, back in the uh, the, the early years of uh, Pope Francis' pontificate, first couple years, I I would follow his... His, uh, his daily homilies quite closely. And about the eighth time that I saw or read or heard Pope Francis encouraging Catholic lay people to carry a New Testament with them, I finally broke down. I'm like, okay, the successor of Peter is asking me to do this. Why don't I just do it? So I got online and I bought a pocket Bible, pocket New Testament for myself and for all my family members. And I've been trying to carry it with me ever since, like Michael did. And there's more to that story of Michael I'm going to get back to in a minute. Uh, In fact, I have a bunch of pocket New Testaments here with me at the conference. I'd love to sell out of them so I don't have to cart them back to Steubenville. But but, uh, this is is my favorite uh, version. You see, uh, it's real slim, and it's about the size of a cell phone. See that? See that? And... um, I'm trying to get away from this and get more into this. There's so much fake, yeah, give it up. Because this has fake news and this has good news. (laughs) Amen. And instead of checking the news all the time, which used to be my big addiction, I'm trying to check the good news more often. And again, this is nice because this is about the size of a cell phone, so you can put it in one of those cell phone holders in your belt or slip it in your pocket, you know. And then the next time you're at the supermarket, you know, uh, buying a couple gallons of milk because your wife called and, honey, pick up some milk on the way home, you know. And so you're sitting in the line, you know, in in the 20-item line and, and the... The guy in front of you has 24 items, you know, and you're like, oh, geez, I would have to get into the line with the line breaker guy, you know. So anyway, so you're sitting there, you got nothing to do. What, what do we all do? Well, you, you kind of instinctively go down there, you know, and you reach for the phone. You're going to check your text and, and your email. But what you do, gentlemen, is you plant this in your, in your cell phone holder or whatever, and you reach down there, and you, you pull that out, and you're like, oh, I've got mail (laughs) from Jesus. 
love one another. Well, that's good. All right, so I'm trying to do that more, and, uh, and Pope Francis uh, has, has recommended that. And again, you know, I was, as, as you're going to find out, <clears throat> I was brought into the church by a Bible-toting Catholic. So he would answer from Scripture when I would, would attack the Catholic Church, and there was one incident that was very memorable to me. Um, you know, I, I can't remember exactly what arguments I had made, but I remember clearly that he had defeated all my arguments over our lunch one afternoon, and I was getting kind of frustrated and, and uh, desperate, and so I started looking around, just trying to get ideas, and I was looking around the food court at uh, Notre Dame, and my eyes alighted on a, uh, a deep relief engraving of the Blessed Mother uh, patterned after Our Lady of Guadalupe. I didn't know that it was based on Our Lady of Guadalupe at that time, but uh, in hindsight, I realized it was. And then under the engraving of the Blessed Mother, there was an inscription that said, uh, Our Lady, Queen of Heaven. And that gave me an idea. And I came back to Mike, and I'm like, okay, okay, I got one for you now. All right, this title, Mary, Queen of Heaven, that is almost blasphemous. I challenge you to produce any part of Scripture that gives any credence to the idea that the blessed that uh, that Mary didn't call her the Blessed Mother back then that Mary was, is the Queen of Heaven. I thought, and I got him now, so I kind of you know I was kind of self satisfied after that. I was like, fold my arms, kind of lean back. I'm like, okay, Catholic wizard boy, <laughs> see what you do with that, huh? Are you like them apples, you know? But he got, I, I got no reaction out of him. He listened to this. He's just looking at me, just kind of blank. He's a, as if I had just, you know, lofted him a big high uh, pitch and slow pitch softball, you know, for him to hit out the park. But, park, but you know, was very impressed with myself. He's like, what? He's like, well, what about Revelation 12? And I got a little uncomfortable. I was like, well, what about it? I said, well, have you read it recently? Well, not recently. Well, why don't we look at it? So, you know, I, I recall him, like, pulling out that Bible. And uh, we go to Revelation 12, and this is a passage that many of you know well. And it says, A great portent appeared in the heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. So she's clothed with the sun, she's got the moon under her feet, and she's got the stars on the head. So where is she? In the sky. <laughs> well, it's, it says heaven right here in the RSV. Can we say heaven? All right. So she, she's heavenly, okay, heavenly woman. Now she's wearing a crown of 12 stars. So what kind of women wear crowns? Princesses. <laughs> we say queens. Uh, yeah, I'll grant you that. All right. So, so we got a heavenly queen. Yeah, yeah. It looks like a heavenly queen there. Uh, and then you drop down to verse five. She brought forth a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Now, now, who would that be? Oh, uh, you know. That's an allusion to Psalm 2. That's the Davidic Messiah. You know, ask of me, I'll make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with a rod of iron, dash them in peace like a potter's vessel. Yeah, I was an Old Testament guy. I was getting a dissertation in the Old Testament. So I knew that that was a reference to Psalm 2. So, yeah, and, and the Davidic Messiah is, well, Jesus, of course. Okay, says Mike. So, got this heavenly queen that gives birth to Jesus. Now, do we know of any other women in the Bible that give birth to a Messiah. Okay, man, quit playing with me. Score one for Catholics here. I didn't see that one coming, all right? And I tried to put a good face on it. He had just defeated my best argument of the day. I think I slunk home with my tail between my legs. But um, that actually shook me up, that whole experience. Because up until this point, up until this point, Every time that uh, Michael had produced some kind of scriptural defense for the Catholic Church, I felt like, you know, he's pulling, 
cards out of his sleeves, doing some kind of Catholic magic tricks with, uh, with Scripture, but I wasn't really convinced. But when he went through Revelation 12 and I looked at it, I was like, yeah, that's a pretty close argument there, you know? That was a lot more plausible than a bunch of Baptist interpretations I had heard of Revelation while I was growing up. You know, Baptists are on all kinds of charts. They got centerfolds of Revelation, you know, books that fold out and little diagrams of all the second comings of Jesus and all the times the saints are brought up and then all the times that Russia invades everybody, you know. And that was all supposed to be strict, literal exegesis of the text. And uh, growing up, you know, rubbing shoulders with Baptists, I'd always given them the benefit of the doubt. And said, yeah, you know, that, that sounds a little bit uh, uh, tenuous to me, but I will give you the benefit of the doubt, and maybe that's, that's a possible interpretation. But here's a Catholic going boom, 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 almost a syllogism out of Revelation 12, making an application to Mary. And I'm like, he could be right. He could, he could really be right. That might be talking about Mary. And I've never seen it before in my life. And my mom had started me reading the Bible through in a year when I was age 12. Genesis in January, Revelation in December, reading through. And I kept that up through most of my, uh, my adolescence, uh, high school and college, etc. That was my devotional pattern. So, and here I was getting a doctorate in Scripture. And I already had a degree in Scripture. I had a master's degree in Scripture and another master's degree in Divinity. And I've been reading the Bible all my life. And I never saw that Revelation 12 could possibly you know, be applied to Mary. And that shook me up. And I thought to myself, well, what else is in there that I haven't been seeing? <laughs> well, I was going to find out. Because <laughs> we continued to meet together over the, the subsequent weeks. By the way, that was my second reason, Scripture. And I'll come back to that again. Second reason I came to the church, Scripture. But we continued to meet together over the subsequent uh, weeks and Michael showed me a lot of other things that I didn't realize from Scripture, uh, looking more closely at, say, the passages on the Eucharist. And um, <clears throat> I was beginning to realize that you could mount a really good biblical defense of the Catholic faith over, this, over the coming weeks and months as we would uh, meet on a regular basis. However, there was a problem. It wasn't just enough to make a case for Catholicism because I still had what I thought was a scriptural case for Calvinism. So I had, you know, Catholicism over there. I could see the Catholic verses, but then you got Calvinism over here, and I could see the Calvinist verses. And it was like two systems of interpretation. But like, who's to know which is better? Okay? Who is to cast the deciding vote? Or what's to tip the scales here be between two alternate ways of reading the Bible? I mean, I was impressed because at first I didn't even think there was a way to read the Bible as a Catholic. Now I saw that there certainly was, but I still had these other, you know, convictions based on a different way of reading. So at that point, Michael made a fateful uh, suggestion in our relationship. You know, he, he said, John, I know we kind of reached a stalemate in Scripture, kind of button heads on that. Why don't we go into the earliest of the church fathers and read their writings and see if they can shed some light for us on the New Testament? Because after all, the earliest of the fathers, they overlapped in lifetime with the apostles. They knew the apostles personally. So if we could read those guys, their writings, since they were in living contact with the apostles, that will probably reflect the original intention of the apostles themselves. Okay? Does this make sense to you, gentlemen? Okay? That, that maybe guys that knew, say, St. John, the apostle, men that knew him, would have a better understanding of his gospel than maybe you or I would 2,000 years later. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm just checking, just checking. It makes sense to me, okay? But I have run into people that just dismiss the, the church fathers. Ah, you know, those, those martyrs that knew the apostles, what did they know, you know? They were, they were just wrong, okay? Like, okay, so you got your MDiv from something or other seminary in Idaho, and 
It's 2,000 years later, and you know better than a guy that knew the Apostle John and then went to the lions uh, confessing the faith on his lips. Okay, fine. Okay, I will come to you next time I have a question. I will seek wisdom at your feet, okay? All right, I'm just checking, just checking, you know, because this makes sense to me. So, so Michael said that, like, wow, that sounds great, but we don't have anybody from that early. We don't have anybody from before Nicaea. And Mike looks at me, he's like, uh, yes, we do. I'm like, really? I'm like, I never heard of that. Yeah, he's like, yeah, we do. We, we, we got guys called the Apostolic Fathers. Have you heard of the Apostolic Fathers? Never heard of them. Well, why don't we get a copy of the Apostolic Fathers and, and take a look at their writings? So like, yeah, that sounds great. You know, if these guys knew the apostles, you know, they'll give us insight in how to interpret the New Testament. So I was excited. I was convinced I was going to get the Apostolic Fathers. These were guys that you know, knew the apostles, and, uh, and they were going to make my case for Calvinism. You know, it was going to be predestination, salvation by faith alone, Bible alone. That's what I was going to find in these guys. So just, I was like, okay, this is going to be great. I was going to end the argument, going to win Mike over. So we go, and we get a, I, I got a copy, made sure it was a Protestant translation. I uh, didn't want any of this papish, you know, uh, 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 manipulation of, of the truth, you know. So, uh, so I got a, a, a early Christian writings by Penguin Books, and it was a copy with uh, um, Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, and Polycarp, and some others. So I began reading. I started with Clement of Rome. I read his letter to the Corinthians. Mm, not really doing it for me. Doesn't really say anything about predestination. Doesn't say anything about salvation by faith alone. Doesn't say anything about the Bible alone. Instead, he's talking about the importance of the visible unity of the church and obeying your, your leaders and those who have validly received holy orders. Well, that doesn't sound very Calvinist. That sounds pretty Catholic. And uh, that's, that's kind of making me uncomfortable. Plus the whole fact that he's a bishop of Rome, you know, that's kind of awkward. So moving right along... Moving right along, let's get into this guy, Ignatius of Antioch. Maybe he'll do it for me. Okay, so this is the context. Ignatius of Antioch, he was bishop of the city of Antioch, which is in modern-day Syria. And um, he was uh, arrested for being a leader of the Christian community. He was being taken to Rome uh, to face his martyrdom, where he would be eventually uh, eaten by lions in the Colosseum. And he knew that was his fate. They knew that they were going to feed him to the lions, and he writes about it. So he's being taken in a cart along the coast of Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. No Turks there back in the day. It was all a Greek-speaking landmass back then. So he's being taken along there in the, through these Greek cities in Asia Minor, many of the same ones that St. Paul ministered to maybe 50 years earlier. And as he's being taken through these cities and they make a stop to get food and water for the soldiers that are guarding him, etc., at each stop he dashes off a letter to the local church. And thanks be to God, seven of them have been preserved authentically for us. The seven authentic letters of Ignatius of Antioch makes very stimulating reading during Lent, by the way. I only re recommend this for some spiritual reading for the few weeks that we have remaining here uh, before we celebrate Easter. But in any, any event, this is Ignatius of Antioch. So it, he is writing these letters in 106, okay, 106. So they're just in three digits at this time, okay? Um, this is uh, a long time ago. And to put, give some context, the Apostle John probably died, most scholars think, around 96 A.D., okay? So, so 106 A.D., so it's only about 10 years after the Apostle John has gone home to the Lord. John is still, as it were, warm in the grave, and Ignatius is writing these letters. So I'm, I'm reading these letters uh, going along. I'm looking for... That, uh, that good Protestant doctrine, and I'm not finding it. Instead, Ignatius is making me feel very uncomfortable because he's saying things like, no Eucharist is valid except that which is approved by your bishop. And as Calvinists, we didn't believe in the Eucharist or bishops. And here this early pastor is talking about that. Then a little bit farther along, Ignatius says, wherever the bishop is, there is the Catholic Church. Is the Catholic Church here today? Amen. Okay. That's right. Get up for Bishop Gator. Gathered around the successor of an apostle. We're, we are truly concent, uh, concentrated, uh, excuse me, uh, cons, uh, consecrated as the church. Constituted, excuse me. 
So anyway, uh, he says, wherever the bishop is, there is the, uh, the Catholic Church. So that's awkward again. I didn't think that the word Catholic got invented until like the 1200s. And here in the 100s, they're already saying, you know, Catholic Church, okay? So then and there were other painful things that he said I didn't much care for. But this was the kicker. I get to his letter to the Smyrnaeans, okay, to the town of Smyrna. And again, he's, he's there overnight, and he's dashing off this letter to the local congregation. And about midway through the, his letter to the local congregation, he starts warning them about the heretics, about, about false teachers. Let's put it that way. He starts warning them about false teachers. And he says, beware those who have such perverted notions of God. And then he goes through a list of different uh, attributes of these false teachers. They don't love the poor. They don't care for the widow and the orphan. Um, some other characteristics. And then he says, they even absent themselves from the Eucharist and the public prayer because they will not confess the Eucharist to be the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ which suffered for our sins and which the Father in his goodness raised up for us. And I read that. Did he just say what I thought he said? So I read that again. They will not confess that the Eucharist, they will not confess the Eucharist to be the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, which suffered for our sins and which the Father in his goodness raised up. And I read that a third time, and I thought to myself, there's no way to get a symbolic reading out of what he just said. He's saying it's really the flesh of Jesus. Okay? And then something came back to me. Okay? In order to serve in the group that I used to belong to, I had to sign a doctrinal affirmation that affirmed, among other things, that the Eucharist, the Catholic Mass, okay, the Catholic Mass and the Catholic Eucharist were a condemnable idolatry because in the Mass, bread and wine were worshipped as if they were God, and since they were just bread and wine, they were only creatures, and therefore to worship the creature rather than the creator's idolatry, therefore the Mass was a condemnable idolatry. I don't know any more explicit denial that the Eucharist is the flesh of Jesus Christ. But I had to affirm that. And it suddenly dawned on me, Ignatius is warning the true Christians about people like me. <laughs> and I had this, this mental experience where I felt like I could see Ignatius like down the shaft of time. And he was waving at me. He's like, hey, John. I'm like, hey, Ignatius. And he starts reaching his hand towards me. I'm like, why is he reaching? It's kind of like plastic man. He's like stretching his hand through the shaft of time. Like, and he's like reaching his hand. Like, why is he doing that? And all of a sudden, I find out why. <laughs> he's slapping me upside my face from a distance of 2,000 years. You, John, are the false teacher. I began to think of all the Catholics that I had, non-practicing Catholics that I had led out or, you know, disaffected from the church and brought into my congregation up in Michigan. And then I started looking back at church history. I thought, well, th if this is true, if it really, if it really is Jesus' flesh, then the Catholics are right. And then I'm looking back through church history and, and all the white hats are switching to black hats and all the black hats are switching to white hats. And I'm, I'm feeling like the Russian spy who wanders into an American library and reads about Bolshevism for the first time and realizes I'm working on the wrong side. I felt like Luke Skywalker hanging from the, from the skywalk in the shaft. And here comes Vader, only Vader has a miter. <laughs> John, I am your father. No! I don't want to become Catholic. 
I had this sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. Oh, no. Is this true? So I thought, well, maybe Ignatius is a one-off. You know, maybe he's the only father that says that, that it's really the flesh of Jesus. Oh, he's not a one-off. Right? Every other father I checked that talks about it was saying the same thing. You know, Ambrose, Origen, Irenaeus, you go, Augustine, Augustine's big, because Lutherans and Calvinists trace them, think they trace themselves back to Augustine. Augustine says things like, Jesus held his own body in his hands at the Last Supper. St. Augustine, whom Calvinists, again, so revere, like John Calvin quotes Augustine on almost every page of the Institutes of the Christian Religion, his big, his big book that he wrote. Anyway, Augustine says, it's not a sin to worship the Eucharist, which is what I had to affirm. It was a condemnable idolatry. Augustine says, it's not a sin to worship the Eucharist. It's a sin not to worship the Eucharist. That's St. Augustine. I just about wet myself when I read that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So all the fathers are saying it. And then I go back into the New Testament, and I reread the passages in the New Testament about the Eucharist, and it suddenly dawns on me, you know what? All these passages, the literal sense is just saying it, it is his body. That's what Matthew says, that's what Mark says, that's what Luke says. Even Paul says it in 1 Corinthians. It's just his body. And then Paul says if you eat it unworthily, you're profaning the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Not profaning a symbol, but you're profaning the body and blood. Because it is a participation in the body and blood. Not a symbol of, but a participation in. Wow. Like, why did I not see this? But you see, the, apost the apostolic fathers and the other fathers broke me out of my blinders. I, was, I had a kind of a brainwashing about reading the New Testament. Could not even see the plain sense of the text. So, and then I began to think. If it's really true that Jesus is present, really present, his own flesh present in the Eucharist, if that's really true and it's not simply a symbol, that outweighs all the different doctrinal issues that I used to quibble about in my tradition, like how exactly does predestination work and how exactly does faith and works cooperate and all these other things that has resulted in well over 50,000 different Protestant denominations. I think, but if Jesus is there, that is reality. That is not esoteric debate. That is reality. And if only Catholics have it, and if only Catholics believe it, I'm there. Amen? Amen? That's the Eucharist. That is just a black hole of theological gravity if the Eucharist is really present. And that is a huge dividing difference between Catholics and all Protestant groups, none of which hold to the real presence, and then f further, as we know, don't have valid succession in order to have the authority to consecrate it. So, uh, I made the decision uh, on the basis of the Eucharist almost alone. I thought, you know, I don't fully agree with all the things that my own denomination teaches already. So, I'm not sure about this Mary thing and this Pope thing, but if Jesus is in the Eucharist, good enough for me. I'll put up with Mary. I'll put up with the Pope. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't like Scott Hahn, who had to figure everything out first, you know, and have all his T's crossed as I am, frankly, not that smart. But I understood this much. Understood, if that's Jesus in the Eucharist, I just got to join for that sake alone. So within a space of about 36 hours after reading Ignatius of Antioch, his letter to the Smyrnians, I decided I was going to become Catholic. Now, it took about 18 months. Thank you. And the good thing about that, which took about 18 months, I came in on February 24th, 2001, but then I could go to confession <laughs> without worrying about my old cutlass attracting attention in the parking lot because everything was kosher now. Oh, wrong religion, but you know what I mean. <laughs> everything was above board. And confession was such a delight. And let me explain a little bit more about confession. And confession is going to be available to us uh, at this conference. 
But uh, when I was in Protestant ministry, here's another dimension of confession that I hadn't mentioned already, but I was, I was active in deliverance ministry, okay, because I was ministering in an area of the city where there's a high prevalence of drug use, abortion, crime, and when you get those kind of activities going on, evil spirits are never far away. And a lot of the people that prayed to receive Jesus and, and join my church continued to have various kinds of afflictions that, guess what, the seminary never treated, t- taught me to deal with. But thanks be to God, I ran into a much older man who had been working in what we call de- deliverance ministry uh, for many, many decades, and he said, John, I'll help you out. And so I used to take persons that had afflictions and bring them to the home of my friend, and we would... Uh, quite literally, pray and help them to be delivered from the spiritual forces that were oppressing them. And you might ask, well, what did I see? You know, was this the superhuman strength? Were heads spinning around, tongues going out three feet and then back in their mouth? You know, this kind of stuff. No, actually, I never saw any of that because we didn't do that methodology. That is what we would call a power encounter and is more like a, a, a traditional formal exorcism. And there is a place for that. There are some persons who are afflicted where you do need a formal exorcism. And every diocese in the Catholic Church is supposed to have a designated exorcist who handles these situations. Pittsburgh certainly does. One of my former students is the assistant to the exorcist of the Diocese of Pittsburgh. And I know uh, from uh, talking with him firsthand, they are busy all the time. Uh, helping people that have uh, some serious uh, afflictions. But getting back to that, that was not our method. Uh, My older friend, who started out back in the 70s trying to cast out demons in the name of Jesus, found that that was often very traumatic because they did get these supernatural manifestations that you will see, you know, depicted sometimes uh, with, uh, you know, changes and whatnot. But, But basically, the kind of supernatural phenomena that you see portrayed in the movies does in fact happen. You can talk to Father Gary Thomas, who is the designated exorcist of San Jose. He's one of the few exorcists that's publicly known in America because a movie was made about his life and his experiences called The Right, which you may have seen with Anthony Hopkins. And so he's become uh, rather famous and gives talks on exorcism and spiritual warfare and spirituality and so on all around the country. But Father Gary Thomas sees these supernatural manifestations, and so the movies are not completely making that stuff up. But I did not see them because what we did was when an afflicted person came, we would pray that the demons would be quiet, and then my friend would take out a binder, a big three-ring binder, in which he had written down every sin that he had ever experienced or heard of or re- read about in spiritual reading or found in the, in the scriptures, categorized in seven different categories. He would open this binder up, turn it around to face the person being delivered, uh, push it toward them, and then start going down the list with them. Have you ever done this? Have you ever done that? If so, confess and renounce. Confess and renounce. And the person would verbally confess and renounce their sin in the presence of witnesses, myself and other prayer Uh, warriors who were gathered for the purpose. And we found that if a person made a thorough and complete confession and renunciation of sin in the presence of other believers, that was sufficient to get rid of the afflictions, and it was a more permanent, longer-lasting fix than the power encounter with all its drama. Well, what do you know? What does that sound like to you? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, what it was was a non-sacramental general confession, okay? And a general confession is a very thorough confession. We, it, we've gotten out of practice of it in the Catholic Church in this country, but Ignatius of Loyola, St. Francis de Sales, highly recommended all Catholics making a general confession on an annual basis as part of an annual retreat, which is another thing that they recommended that we have kind of let slide and don't remember, but uh, yeah, many of the great spiritual masters of our tradition recommended an annual treat with a general confession. So gentlemen, my, conf- my perspective on confession is it is a form of spiritual warfare. It is the front lines of spiritual warfare. And for me, it's not a judgment chamber. I don't go in there to be judged. I go in there to be liberated. Amen? Amen. I go in there to get my chains broken off. And, and it may look like uh, the most boring of the sacraments. You know, there's no processions, no hoopla. Most of the other sacraments get, 
doesn't even have any substance, any cool thing like oil to it or anything. You know, just people standing in line every five minutes doing this. <laughs> but if we could hear with the ears of faith, it might be the most dramatic of sacraments as we hear the howls of demons being cast out and the breaking of, of bondage and the breaking of chains of sin as folks are being liberated in what we think of as a little closet. Wow. Wow. Let's pray to God to give us the ears of faith and see the, the spiritual realities. Uh, i got to wrap, wrap up here, gentlemen. Um, just quick, you know, folks, is, folks have said to me, you know, with, with all the scandals going on in the church, you ever have buyer's remorse? And frankly, no. Um, I'm distressed. I know we're all distressed at the things that have come out. Um, I've been praying and fasting for purity in the church. I know many of you have been doing so as well. It hurts. It's painful. It's embarrassing. It's distressing. But you know what? It doesn't affect the validity of the sacraments. Because the validity of the sacraments is not dependent on the holiness of the minister. And thanks be to God that God in his wisdom set it up that way. Because, Amen. Let me read a quote from St. Francis of Assisi that I just found this morning. He said, If I were to meet at the same time some saint coming down from heaven and any poor little priest, I would first pay my respects to the priest and proceed to kiss his hands first. I would say, Ah, just a moment, St. Lawrence, because this person's hands handle the word of life and possess something that is more than human. These hands have touched my Lord, and no matter what they be like, they could not soil him or lessen his virtue. To honor the Lord, honor his minister. He can be bad for himself, but for me he is good. Amen to that. Every priest in the world could be a rascal, and to clarify, it's not like that. I mean, 94% of our priests have never been accused of anything. That's what's actually coming out with these statistics. And let's not forget that more than 90%, they're probably suffering worse than us laymen because they live this all day long. So let's not forget as Catholic men to support our faithful priests. Let's give them a hand. But even that priest who is corrupt or sinful, the validity of the sacrament is still there. And when St. Francis was challenged, what if you knew that the priest celebrating Mass was an adulterer? St. Francis said, I would still go forward, take the Eucharist, and kiss the hands that gave it to me. Now, there's a backstory to that, too. That the, the person that was objecting to St. Francis was speaking about a specific situation. St. Francis later went and rebuked that priest that the layman was talking about. But before he gave that priest a fraternal correction, St. Francis kissed his hands and then rebuked him for his sinful lifestyle. So yes, do we need to work for purity? Amen, we need to work for purity. It needs to start with us, too. We need to be living chastity and openness to life as Catholic men. And many of us, you know, are struggle to live the, ch the church's teachings of sexuality ourselves. And it's not just our priests, but it's the whole church that needs to be called to chastity and purity. But th those priests will sanctify us, and we need to be more concerned about ourselves getting to heaven and our own worthy reception of the sacraments than throwing stones about all the other problems that exist in the church. Amen? Amen. I want to get to heaven. And, and even that priest who's, who's struggling, he may not make it to heaven himself, but he will give me the Eucharist, which has the grace, so I may go there. 
and, and thanks be to God, and I'm going to pray for his soul because we all want to go there because Jesus prayed that they may all be one, even as I and the Father are one. And that's another verse that brought me into this church, but I can't talk about that right now. So, gentlemen, let's go to the Lord in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the church that you have brought us into and the graces that are available to us through the sacraments. Help us to always treasure them. Lord, confession, your scriptures, the Eucharist, such powerful reasons to remain within the fold of your church. May we always hang tight to these unchangeable truths, confession, Eucharist, the scriptures. May we cling to them through difficult times. Because, Lord, we know through them you will raise us up to yourself and bring us into eternal life. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Gentlemen, the rest of my story is in this book, Stunned by Scripture, How the Bible Made Me Catholic. I also have plenty of these. If you want to be a Bible-toting Catholic, pick one up at my table back there. Thank you so much. It's been great to be with you here in Harrisburg. <laughs>